fairly certain that the name Alexandre de Rique won't be familiar to many, and particularly so outside Spain. And yet he was the most significant Spanish Art Nouveau illustrator, artist and designer the 19th century produced. He was born the seventh Count of Casa Davalos in 1856 in the Spanish region of La Seguera. And in his early teens he studied art in France, in Bézier between 1869 and 1871, and he subsequently enrolled into the School of Fine Arts in Toulouse. Even when he returned to Spain, he continued to study at art school in Barcelona. Although he was of noble birth, the sources I've used claim that for unknown reasons he ran into financial difficulties around 1880, which seems to have given him the incentive to take the idea of making a living more seriously. And in 1892 he opened a studio and workshop with his cousin in Barcelona, where they created jewellery, furniture design and decorative ceramics. He was also working with some success as a painter and engraver, but it was his illustrated work which soon came to dominate his output. In 1896 he created the first poster for the Exposition of Arts and Industries in Barcelona, and this dramatically enhanced his reputation for Art Nouveau image making, leading to a long line of poster commissions from a variety of sources. All of these were reproduced using traditional lithography, involving several tightly controlled separate colour runs to produce a full colour effect. This was the same painstaking process used by others, including his far better known contemporary, Alphonse Mucha. He was also in great demand for the design and illustration of Ex Libris book plates, which were pasted into the extensive book collections of wealthy clients. Most, but not all, of these were monochrome, and created as finely detailed etchings, a technique he showed remarkable affinity for. Things were going very well for him by this point, but sadly his first wife died in 1899. Naturally he was grief-stricken, but after a period of mourning and with two children to raise, he returned to work. In 1900 he created the magazine Joventut, and worked as its artistic director, as well as creating illustrations for its pages. And somehow he also found time to establish a successful school for graphic design. Throughout the first decade of the 20th century he continued to paint and create illustrations for magazines and posters, but as the second decade unfolded it seems he lost interest in commercial work and having remarried in 1911, he set about travelling extensively with his second wife, painting and drawing the landscapes they encountered. Sadly, he never returned to illustration, and Dorica died on the island of Mallorca in 1920 at the age of 64. When I made the video about the German arts magazine Jugend, Adolf Munzer was one of the very few contributors that I was able to find any information about so I'm glad to be able to include him here. He was born in 1870 in Upper Silesia, which was then considered part of Germany, although now it's more Czechoslovakia. His father died when Adolf was only six, and he moved with his mother to Breslau in 1886 at the age of 16, after which there's a total absence of information until eight years later in 1894, when he began studying at the Academy of Fine Arts in Munich at the age of 24. Once his studies were completed, he set himself up as an artist, and he achieved reasonable success within a short space of time. Despite this success, a few years later in 1899, he also started creating illustrations for the magazines Jugend and Simplicissimus, both of which were based in Munich. Between these two publications, Mernzer had the best of both worlds. Eugen gave him the opportunity to express himself with imagination and to explore fantasy and romantic subjects. And for Simplicissimus he was able to harness the harsher political and satirical side of his illustration. These two weren't his only clients and he also ventured on occasion into advertising and created some children's bookwork during his career. His interpretation of the story of Cinderella was created as a series of colour lithographs drawn directly onto stone, and his grainy but fine line work was used to create broadly representational but far from realistic images. He used the same technique extensively for his magazine work, 
both in colour and monochrome. And with it he was capable of creating dark, densely textured images of considerable menace, romance and even occasional comedy. Alongside his lithographic work there were also some examples of painted colour illustration for Jugend, created in both watercolour and oils. Quite a few of these were reproductions of images he'd originally created as art for gallery exhibition. This was common practice among the artists who contributed to the magazine and a good way of making more money for no extra work. In 1909 he also took a position as the Professor of Painting at Dusseldorf Art Academy and he continued to work there until the early 1930s. Like Dorica, he simultaneously carried on with his art and illustration, for a while at least. But Mernza was yet another who eventually tired of illustration and he turned increasingly towards painting as his sole means of visual expression. Examples of his work did continue to appear in Ugend even into the 1920s, but these were yet more reproductions of work created purely as art in the first instance. And for the rest of his life he continued to work exclusively as an artist and he died in 1953 at the age of 67. American illustrator Ernest Hamlin Baker was born in 1889 in New York and despite a lack of formal art education he managed to be taken on as a staff artist for a local newspaper at the age of only 17. He did subsequently go on to attend Colgate University and once he graduated in 1912 he immediately set about a career as a freelance illustrator. Examples of his work from this period are thin on the ground but following the USA's entry into the Great War he created some domestic propaganda posters using a heavily posterized style combining bold line work and flat spot colour. Following the war he continued to create posters but was also in demand for his monochrome illustrations which although created in pen and ink successfully mimicked the look of woodcut or scraper board. And although by this time his career was on a fairly even keel it wasn't until 1930 that he had his first significant breakthrough. In that year Baker was commissioned to create his first cover for the prestigious and expensive business magazine Fortune and the success of the first illustration led to many others throughout the 1930s. All of them were remarkably compelling images which used modernist graphic techniques, unusual colour palettes and dynamic composition. These remarkably confident illustrations were a far cry from his earlier wartime posters. An online auction site selling Baker's originals lists his work as being created with pen, ink and gouache and that's probably correct for most of them, although one or two undoubtedly break free of that method. Having said that, I haven't got a clue how they were actually created. During the 1930s he also painted murals as part of the public art scheme set up by the WPA, and he created more posters, press ads and magazine illustrations. In 1939 he created his first portrait for the cover of Time magazine and, just like his covers for Fortune, there had been very little in his earlier output to hint that he was also capable of such accomplished, finely detailed representational painting. But it was this series of portraits which would become his defining body of work for the rest of his career, and up to 1956 he would go on to produce more than 300 of these astonishingly detailed images. Some of the portraits were created as monochromes for the inside pages and these were produced as pencil drawings with a precision and sensitivity few could hope to achieve. And when it came to colour he used a combination of gouache and pencil which created a richly textured effect. Others among this vast collection are described as being rendered in watercolour but whatever medium he used he used it with total authority and attention to detail. In 1956 Baker created the last of these portraits and there seems to be no evidence of any later work or account of what he did subsequently. I did find a couple of seascape paintings by him and it's quite possible that he simply retired. So all I can offer is that following a career of almost half a century he died in 1975 at the age of 86 in Norton, Massachusetts.
The particularly obscure British illustrator Harold Jones was born in London in 1904. From the age of 16 he studied at Goldsmiths College and after two years there he had another two at Camberwell School of Art before taking a scholarship at the Royal College of Art. He finally left education in 1929 but promptly went back into it as a teacher at a secondary school in 1930. But in 1934 he summoned up the strength of purpose to quit his job and attempt a career as a freelance illustrator. In 1936 he illustrated the book August Adventure by Mary Atkinson and this helped to get him established. But it was the 1937 publication of his colour illustrations for This Year, Next Year, a collection of verses by Walter de la Mer, which brought Jones much wider attention from the publishing industry and the public. Despite the mannered formality of his stylistic approach, they made for a particularly evocative, wistful series of images. And they were all created as traditional lithography, not from necessity but from choice. This would have made their production both time consuming and technically demanding, but it would have been virtually impossible to create these richly textured images any other way. And in the later 1930s he also designed book covers, including two for H.G. Wells novels in 1937, and in 1938 another for C.S. Lewis's science fiction novel Out of the Silent Planet. With particularly bad timing, Jones' first authored book, The Visit to the Farm, was published in 1939, the year the Second World War began. Consequently, the book sold far fewer copies than it actually deserved. And not much later he joined the Royal Engineers and was forced to suspend his career for the duration. In 1945 he started working again, and in 1947 his second authored book, The Enchanted Night, was published featuring yet more of what had by now become his trademark use of traditional lithography. In 1950 he began a collaboration with writer Kathleen Lyons and together they created several books for children, including the particularly attractive and successful collection of verse Lavender's Blue in 1954. And although I have no verifiable evidence, I'm pretty sure that these were not lithographs but pen and ink with watercolour washes simply because they are demonstrably more painterly and tonally applied. It seems that from this point on he worked both ways and he continued to be remarkably prolific for another three decades. There were some religiously themed books for children such as the story of Noah's Ark as well as the expected classic works including an edition of Aesop's Fables. William Blake's Song of Innocence in 1958 and Browning's Pied Piper of Hamelin in 1962 were both visually imaginative and absorbing successes. And Harold Jones didn't stop working until 1984 when he was 80 years old. And he died in London in 1992 at the age of 88. That's it for this time around and I hope I'll see you when the next one's done.